This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. As I went to put the seat back, I seen him coming round, you know, and I just opened the door and as I got one leg out, he already had the gun there. I remember when I was on him, man, Jesus Christ, I, I was like... Um... It was all like the guns, uh, the harm response, helicopters, you know, everything above, you know. It was like, shut out the city off to take me to the court. I said, you ain't got your bulletproof vest on. I said, what do you need a bulletproof vest? I said, you fucking prick. Start the van and get it out there. I was still heavily being looked into with the police when I was in prison. You know, I was still under constant investigation for the full, full duration. And as soon as I stepped out the gate, it continued. How the fuck does that happen like that? That switch of being a criminal to then being training people to be the best fighters on the planet. Even the people upstairs, you know, the two people, you know, those gag bound and gag laid on the bed, stretching out, you know. I thought, fucking hell, what is this? All as I remember, it was a was a lovely young fella, you know. And listen, if it would have meant giving our lives for him to win that fight, we'd have done it. We was uh, was in there, Cathay again. And I was looking uh, multiple charges. You know, if I went, if would have went wrong, I was, I was getting thirty plus years. And boom, we're on. And today's <laughs> guest, we've got big Peter Fury. Peter, good to see you, James. Absolute pleasure, brother. Pleasure. Yeah, listen, a man that's very well respected all around, not just the UK, but the world, for the things that you've achieved. Listen, some dark things, but a lot of positives. Like, so many positives, and listen, that's life. Like, I know a lot of people who's very well connected with you, and they speak highly, so highly of you. Like, there's yeah. not many people who show respect, but for me, I don't... I like a lot of people, but don't respect a lot of people, and you're one of those men who I do respect. Thank you, James. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you try and be right with people. That's the thing, go for your life. And that's it, you know. In... Uh, in all parts of my life, I've always been respectful to uh, to the people that I've been around, associated with, and the friends I've got over the years. Yeah, that's all you can do. That's all you can do, yeah. That's it. And uh, every, you try and better yourself every day, don't you? Yeah. Before we get into everything, Peter, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, how you function, kind of where you grew up, how it all began. What can I tell you? <laughs> I probably began when I was about nine years of age. So... Uh, yeah, gone uh, way back. So, yeah, just uh, worked very hard as a young fella. What age? From about uh, any age, nine, ten, eleven. We was put to work very young. So yeah, is that the travelling nature straight away? That's a uh, travelling culture. Yeah, that's not just for me. That's uh, that's the way travellers was, you know. Yeah, and your mum is at Hugh and, and Sissy. Is that correct? That's right. That's How were they, as parents? Best parents in the world, you know, the best. I was very, very lucky to have them. You know, they brought us up well and uh, very proud of my mother and father, what they've done for us. Yeah. How what about school, Peter? Because I know a lot of the travelling community don't really go to school, but what about yourself? Yeah, I went to school till I was about uh, the big age of eight. <laughs> so, but you know, I remember it well. 
I went from five to eight, so I spent about three years in different schools all around uh, all around the country. Week here, week there, two weeks here, two weeks there. You know, doing a bit of colouring and stuff. But uh, yeah, but no, I never, really, I never learnt anything at school. I wasn't interested in it. Did that become the norm for you? Like, <coughs> with did you understand what a traveller was then? Is it a very young age? It was just the way we lived. It was our, uh, it was our culture. You know, so we always. Uh, I don't know, I never differentiated as uh, being any different from anybody else, but the people did in the school and stuff, so I knew he was I knew he was a bit different. But uh, it was a bit different back then than what it is today. Were you ever like, out? Like, people know were you, when you were different then, did people try and bully you, try and... Like... Yeah, the, the normal stuff in school, play, playgrounds, we had it. You know, the, you'd be being called names and stuff, and... Uh, singled out nobody would play with you and all that type of stuff you know but it was uh, listen they done me a favour at the end of the day because it makes you stronger doesn't it what doesn't kill you makes you stronger uh, what was your first ever job first ever job was probably doing a bit of snow clearing off drives and stuff when it was snowing that's all I can remember you know little bits and pieces jobs for people and uh, you know going around the houses where we lived and Asking them if they needed any work and stuff like this, you know, any manual jobs. Mm -hmm. So we do a little bit of that. What did your mum and dad do? Uh, my mother and father, they was like into uh, mainly a little bit of everything, but mainly um, they'd be door to door salespeople, selling carpets, selling uh, selling bedding, you know, all this type of stuff. That's what they were doing. Big family, eh, Peter, as well? Is it three, four brothers? Uh, four brothers, including myself, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who was it with everybody at that time? It was good. We just all stuck together. We played together and, uh, you know, we just stuck together as a family. It was a good uh, type family unit mm -hmm. when we was younger. What was your first proper job? <sighs> proper job? As in, as in what? Legit. Legit? Well, like just, there, was, there was all legit, you know, when I was growing up, you know, uh, you know, done many things, done many things, put, put my hands to everything. But probably the uh, motor trade. I got involved in that when I was, uh, shortly after I was married. Because you met your wife, she plays a big <coughs> part in your life, I believe. What makes a man is that, I believe, if you have a strong woman by your side, your life is then on the right path. Like, but it's difficult nowadays, Peter, if I'm honest, like, with so much social media and attention, like it's so easy for people to get mixed up in different relationships, sharing different energies. Back then, it's kind of my mum and dad married at 16, 17, like yeah, yeah. 36 years with before my yeah. dad passed. God rest, his, God rest his soul. But you don't really see that anymore, that commitment, because let's be honest, love is painful. Love is fucking hard. It's not all skipping down the road holding hands. It's when the shit hits the fan. Is your partner going to be there? Is you going to be shagging the guy next door? Like, that's the main thing about life. But how did your relationship start with your uh, missus? Well, I met my missus when I was young, 14, and we've seen each other for two and a half years. And we got married uh, just two months shy of being 17, you know? So I was still 16. You know, I just remember it. Went into a registrar in Bradford. We just got married and uh, that was it. <coughs> got in the van. <laughs> Next day, work. <laughs> that was it there was no there was no honeymoons then there was nothing because there was no money you know it was hurt it was hard but you know look you know when um, when there's two people I remember it you know it was when we started out you know we never any anything so but we was on our own we was on our uh, you know we didn't get any handouts we'd done our own thing and we struggled along how did you? How do you manage to keep a relationship for so long, Peter? Like, what's the what's the main ingredient? Do you think? I think. Listen, you know when you when you, that look, everything comes into it. Love, loyalty, it's the same thing. You know, if somebody's in your heart and you think the world of them, and you'll die for your family. That's it. You know, and it's a uh, it's not a one way street. She you know she's been uh, she's been the rock behind this family. You know, so. You know, all the boys, all the girls have got six kids. You know, they ring the mother. They don't ring me, you know. So uh, <laughs> I only get a call when there's a problem. <laughs> Basically, the mother's uh, the backbone of the of the full family, really. So you're 16, you're married. Like, what way did your life go then? Obviously, I think you get the car trade, is that correct? 
Uh, not straight away. I'd done all kinds of different things, you know, just to scrape a living here and there. We got married. I touched on it earlier. You know, we sold all kinds of things, horse shit, whatever it may be, scrap metals, uh, doing trees, gardening, whatever it may be, you know, we just uh, try to do everything. How much do you make from horse shit? <clears throat> Very little, you know. Look, when you've got no money, you're happy to make anything. That's the thing. People can lose where they've come from because... When you've got no money, you'll settle to do anything. You're just very happy to make it to the next day. You know, that that's how it was. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a few quid and think, oh, you know, thank God I, I can, you know, we can eat, you know, we can do things, we can pay the rent or whatever. You know, that's that's the way it was back then. So you're always, uh, you're always fighting to keep your head above water. Where were you living then? I was living on, uh, on uh, traveler sites, gypsy sites. Um, Mainly in uh, Accrington, Lancashire. We was there for a bit. How was it there? It was good. I enjoyed it. You know, we stayed on a place called Jim West Place in Oseltwizzle. And there was uh, good people. You know, travellers again who owned the place, you know. And they uh, got on with the people very, very well. Why is, why is the travellers, why are they such tough bastards? Like, how, why is that blood, that ingrained, the fighting spirit, like, where does that come from? I don't know, it might come from hardship, you know, it can come from past generations, I've no idea, but, you know, there's a lot of travellers that's uh, not interested in uh, trouble or, or hardship. A lot, a, a lot of gypsy people are very, very clever. You know, they can get on their own two feet, you know, they'll, they'll survive. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're tipped out in the jungle, they'll find a way, you know, that's always been the way, really, going back <laughs> generations with travellers, you know. What do you look at kids now, Peter, like? with suicide on their eyes and everything seems soft and people just seem weak. Like, it's not to bring men down. Like, I'll do everything in my power to try and guide men to understand life and you've got to push through the pain. But with the travelling, upbringing, like working seven, six, seven, eight, just pushing, providing. I know many travellers now, especially with the line of work I'm in, we became good friends and they're fucking 100%. They're solid. Like, they work hard. Provide for their family, old school morals. The missus is kind of looks after the kids, makes a lovely meal, home is clean. Like, what do you think a lot of people is missing with the kids nowadays? Well, it's not only in uh, uh, other cultures; it's in it's with travellers as well. You see a lot of it. You know where, uh, you know, the girls, the young girls today are not respectable. They'll shag every fella they can get their hands on. You know, it's that's just the way it is. A lot of uh, travellers has lost the way, to be honest with you. So it's the same in all cultures of life, and there's still some good, decent people out there. But it's rare today. It's like rare, it's like diamonds, you know, because I know this because I speak to my sons all the time, and they're telling me, Dad, I can't find a respectable woman anywhere, so I'm not going to bother. Mm. You know, it's like this. So it's uh, it's not easy. It's not easy, because all the shit, what goes on, looking at all these internets, you know, er anything goes today. There's no bounds, is there? You know? yeah. So see when you started getting into the car trade, you you were you were flying it, you were fucking smashing it. Like, yeah, yeah. Life going well, making a bit of money. Like, how was life for you then? Life was good. You know, we was uh, yeah, we was doing very well. From our, what does it what does they say? From rags to riches, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, and you know we had full and plenty. But you know you can't take what's I say? And um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I didn't appreciate it back then. But you know, yeah, what you are, aren't you? I don't think uh, I'm. A, I was back then. I would say I was a walking contradiction, because I'd do anything to get older, get older money, because that was my mindset. Yeah, but when I got the money, I didn't value it. When I got the cars and uh, the houses, I didn't value it. I'd look at it and think, yeah, it's a piece of tin, it's whatever. So it's a, it's a contradiction. I can't really say. I can only really say back then how my mind really was. What do you think was missing? I've no idea, you know, there's a, uh, it's searching for stuff and you can get busy looking on the outside world and, you know, you know, wanting to do uh, better than anybody else and you want to be bigger and you want to do this, you want to do that, but when you look at it, the reason is, what for? I had everything anyway and what I had was the wife and the kids, that's what I should have looked at because that was the main thing and when the penny dropped, that's when I realised that's the main thing in my life. The rest of it's all bullshit. Yeah. So you had a pitch with all your own cars on it? Yeah, we had. Uh, I had a. I had a few uh, pitches with motors on, but uh, yeah, I had. I had one which was big, up to two hundred on it. Yeah. 
So life is going good. You've got the missus. You've got the kids. You're making a bit of dough. But like you say, there's always that something missing, whether it's greed or what, p more power. Like, it's hard to fucking pinpoint even all the mistakes you, you do. You name it. You can have a say, say greed, knowing no bounds, whatever you want to call it. I would stick me with that label. I was all of them. Mm -hmm. You know? Were you a millionaire? A good few times over. From From zero. Like I said, from rags to riches, and we'd made the money, you know. There was no, uh, there wasn't uh, maybe bits of skullduggery here and there, but nothing really. Mm. You know, it was all fit, pro proper business. Yeah. So, see, because you're very well known in the underworld, very well respected as well. Um, so, you've went from a legit millionaire lifestyle. How did you end up getting into the dark side? And it's like anything else. It's a, it's a it's a company you keep and you socialise with different kind of people and you can get involved, you know, from um, from helping out, you know, getting offered money to do things, and then it just uh, it just spirals out of control. Then did your Messi see that? She did, you know, and uh, she was like totally against it all. You know, I always say, you know, if I'd have listened to her, I'd be, <laughs> I would have been, I would have been a different. She had the brains, you know. I'm, I'm the div. <laughs> <laughs> Make no mistake. <laughs> I'm the clown, you know. If you want to wear the clown badge, stick it on yeah. me because she's the brains of the outfit, yeah. you know. Because everything she said was absolutely true, you know. It's mad that, isn't it? And it resounded like, because when I was on 24 hour bang up, yeah, solitary confinement, right? <laughs> 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 Them, uh, her words. Echoed in me ears, along with me dear mother and father as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. What did he say? You never learn until it's too late. Yeah. yeah. It was one of them. So see when you, were you a deck, what is it, a deck? Were you a deck collector at any point? Muscle? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that's what, uh, probably where, that's where it all started. Is that an element of like, buzz control, that like, power where, you know yourself, you've got everything, but there's something missing where you're chasing something external? Yeah, exactly. It was all of that, to be fair. The violence kind of side of things. Yeah. Yeah, it was all of that. You know, just the, uh, the excitement, something different. Young, aren't you? Probably too much testosterone, whatever yeah. you want to call it, you know? Were you bo doing much boxing then, Peter? Not really. I was, uh, I'd always have my hand in it somewhere. I used to train all the time, you know, but I wasn't interested in uh, professional boxing or nothing like that. You know, I had... Uh, how can you be interested in professional boxing when you'd have a fight back in them days and get 250 quid when, you know, I'm already got money. So it just, mm -hmm. it just didn't work practical for me because the businesses I was doing, the money I was earning before the, before all the shit, even the straight business, I'd do it as a hobby, the, the boxing. How do you, it's mad that how a lot of the traveling community as well can then create multi-million pound businesses like, what is that then learning from the just from the streets learning from just being in the hustle because there's kids that can go to university seven years five years reading books can't fucking run a business to say themselves and their communication skills are shite like that's what it's all about for me is communicating if you're a good communicator with an individual man you, you can go anywhere in life I think so it's how you treat people if you're a good communicator I think you're absolutely right James that's the key that's the key to life and like you said you know people you know, you're respected by people. People will work with you. Who, who wants to work with somebody and says, that fellow will have you over? That's a piece of shit in my eyes. You know, mm. you, look, your reputation goes before you. It's like, it's like your fingerprints in a police station. Your reputation never leaves you. You fuck somebody, you have them over or you do some skullduggery. It travels with you. People say, oh, don't mess with him. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's the way life is. Yes. So when you write with people, it comes back. It always comes back to the same thing. You know, being right and being good with people pays you back. Yeah, definitely. So see me you're going through that life then and you're involved in the madness, you're bang involved. That Was there ever anybody that said to you, your mum and dad at that point, look, you're going fucking off the radar here or was you, were you too far gone? Too far gone. Listen, to told me all the time, you know, my old father, you know, God rest his soul, he used to say, you know, listen, my, son, my lad, he'd say, you know, I've never seen anything like it. He said, you know, we said, we are travellers, he said. He says, and I've never seen anything like what you're doing. <laughs> he says, you know, he says, I just don't understand, he says. He said, you, look here, he said, you've got a wife and little kids here. He said, you need, you need to think of them. He said, but I'm going to tell you this, you're going to do a long time in prison or you're going to end up dead. So he said, there's no other way out here. 
He says, you're not going to do what you think you're going to do. And he, he and listen, he, he was he was spot on. Yeah. Fortunately, very fortunately, I got the prison. You know, because if I hadn't got the prison, I would have went one way. It's mad that that our father see things like back in the day. My my dad was a bouncer in Glasgow, and he knew everyone. But that was part of my downfall as well because I used to go to the nightclub, and I thought I fucking owned it when I was 16, 17, because he used to get me in for free. <laughs> and he used to say, stay away from him, stay away from him. And as the years went on, they were either dead or murdered or yeah, yeah. Uh, prison themselves or murdered. Like, it's sad because I, as a father, as I know as a father now, I see my kids and I see that, all right, the mistakes that they can make. And they're still very young, but I just hope they listen to me because my dad, everything he says came true. Yeah. And before he died, my life was a fuck up. Well, you know, I know people, it's like, We've all been and done different things. And, you know, looking at the outside, you think, okay, you know, I'll keep away from him. That guy's highly dangerous, you know, that guy, whatever. But I know some good people that's not here anymore. That's dead. You know, young people in the prime of their life. And, you know, good-hearted, you know, as good as they can be. But they're dead. Mm -hmm. Life cut short. And what for? It's all nonsense. Yeah. It's all bravado. It's all ego. It's all, it's all nonsense, you know. I've lost count how many people's uh, gone that I've known over the years. You know, so it's not good. When was the first time you got the jail, Peter? Uh, I got uh, jail in 1994. I got arrested in 94 and uh, I come out in 2000. I come out the end of 2000. Yeah, October 2000. That was a 10 stretch? Yeah, yeah. That was the first time straight in? First time straight in, yeah. Big sentence now for speed? Yeah, you know, it's because of who you are. You know, it was uh, organised crime. And, you know, they put me at the head of it, so, you know, that's uh, you know that's that's how it was. And I got the full blunt of the law as well. You know, they made sure, you know, I didn't just do normal uh, prison. They made sure it, uh, I f the crime fitted the uh, the sentence or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I had heavy jail, as heavy as it can get. What are you thinking going through court? Is that when kind of your wife's words and your father's words kind of resonate in your mind and you think, I should have listened, or was it later on in your sentence? Well, you grow up, don't you? You know, you're learning. You know, you you know, you learn the hard way, and I've learned the hard way. You know, nobody's given me anything, and I've, you know, and I have, I've, I've learned the hard way. And you know what it is? There's one thing having, uh, there's one thing having a fight, and you know, you know, you're getting punched all up and down, and you can feel it. You know, your energy's draining, and you know what? You just, you just keep trugging on. That's one thing, but that's, that's super minor compared. When your liberty's stuck, you know, when your liberty's stuck and you've got the full weight, you've got the full weight of the establishment on your back, you know, they're doing anything to get hold of you. You know, that's a different ball game. Because I never had a good time when I was in prison. When I say a good time when I was in prison, I was still heavily being looked into with the police when I was in prison. You know, I was still under constant investigation for the full, full duration. And as soon as I stepped out the gate, it continued. So I never done it easy where I could just sit down and do a, do me jail. I was constantly uh, being looked at. Did you get told you were doing a 10 stretch before? Uh, yeah, they said if it goes wrong, you're going to get, this is the kind of jail you get. Double figures, class B, it's heavy, that. Double no? figures, yeah. But again, you can look at it, it's the shit you, you get away with and don't get caught with where you can get fucking bigger as well, do you know what I mean? You know, I've got no complaints, you know, looking back at it, I've got no complaints at all. You know, I deserved it and I got it, so that's it. I don't blame anybody for it, you know, it's my own doing. Yeah, what jail were you in, Peter? I went straight to uh, Full Sutton, uh, which is a dispersal. It's a, yeah, it's a big it's a big jail, I think it holds a couple of thousand. And I went straight there, as soon as I got sentenced, the day I got sentenced, I was like straight straight up the motorway. It's near York. Cat A? Double Cat A, yeah. That's fucking terrorists and... Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of, or the mad bastards. Like, did you feel that you'd been through under the bus a bit, or were you thinking, listen, you live by it, you kind of have oh, to deal no, with it? I remember when I was on the man, Jesus Christ, I, I was like, um, there was all like the guns, uh, the harm response, helicopters, you know, everything above, you know. It was like shut off the city off to take me to the court, you know, to take me a mile down the road. You know, I got in a van one day and they, they text me at the block because I was in the block, I wasn't even on the wings, yeah. <laughs> I was in the block and you, you're like, you are fucking treated like Hannibal Lecter you know in a fucking banana suit you know so uh, <laughs> well, I get wolfed in this van I'm double shackled yeah and I think there's got to be 
a minimum of six, maybe eight, eight uh, prison officers there, and he gets in the van, and one fella, and this might come over, I was in strange ways, and I'm waiting to be took to court, and he says, uh, you know, permission to move, and I can hear the woo, 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 I can hear the helicopter above, you know, and I'm response outside, they've got all the earpieces in. And this fella, the driver, i never forget, and i seen him later on, and I said, you, what a weak cunt you are. Yeah. And I said, and he went, oh, he said, don't be like that. I said, I am like that. I said, you want to grow a pair of balls? Yeah. He just, I remember that. He just agitated his life out of me. I'm sat there. I'm shackled like out of electric in this van. I've got big, got big prison guards, yeah, like as high as this house. <laughs> big lump, big units, yeah. What are you going to do? He says, not permission to move, yeah. Uh, and he got all this code. Uh, what's the reason? I haven't got my bulletproof vest on. So I'm listening to this, I'm in the van. I said, you ain't got your bulletproof vest on. I said, what do you need a bulletproof vest? I said, you fucking prick. Start the van and get it out there. <laughs> He's like, and the other one was saying to me, no, 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 can't say. I said, I'll say what I want. I said, that's all I can say. I said, do I look like I can do anything here? Mm. I said, what do you want? I said, uh, you know, and he's ignoring me, you know, permission to move and all that. It's half an hour for him to go and get a, a jacket on so as he could go out the prison gates, you know. It was overkill. It was definitely, <laughs> totally overkill what it was. But then I got, um, during the trial, I had, I was in strange ways in a block. And he used to take me to the crown and he had this, I was in this dock one where they all the bulletproof glass and stuff, you know, so uh, yeah, it was as heavy as it gets. And then I went to, uh, like I say, on the sentence day, I got took straight up to uh, up the motorway, arm response again, <laughs> or straight up the uh, M62, straight to uh, York. What's the worst memory in prison? Uh, the worst memory in prison? Uh, losing your family, I think, you know being away from your family and, uh, you know, and, and stuff like this. I think that's, uh, they're, they're the main memories I've got. Freedom's one thing, you know, and captivity. And honestly, you've got to get used to it because you've never, be, you've never been in them environments before. And you're not in an environment where you're mixing with people, you know, you, you, you're in solitary confinement there. You know, I've got a, I've got a concrete bed, I've got a, a plast, I've got a, I've got a chair made out of cardboard and a, that's it. And you just there's nothing else. So it's uh, you've you've got to adapt. You've got to get used to it. Do you think you lost yourself, or did you think you find just you find yourself? Because a lot of people in prison, you know yourself, Peter. A lot of them are weak. A lot of them turn to the drugs and they're, they come out. They're fucked. Like a lot of people do. It's not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot, but some people find themselves with being with their own voices and with their own space, and they go, okay, wait a minute, look, like, what the fuck have I done here, look? Like, what way did you go in there? Did you think, feel as if you had to keep up that persona and, and keep doing what you're doing? Or did you realise, okay, wait a minute, I've fucked up? To be honest with you, I never had a persona. You know, I was what I was. So I never had a persona to really, to live up to or do anything. I was always a realist. I was, you know, and when I went in there, there was no layers to peel off, you know. It was, I was the same in there as what I was on the street, to be honest. You know, it didn't mean... It meant a lot to me, but like I say, the only thing I miss was the uh, the family, you know, the phone calls and um, and you know m more so than anything, it's what I put them through as well, you know, the phone calls and the crying on the end of the phone and stuff, you know, and the and the and the hassle and the no help they had outside and you feel helpless to help your family and you know what you've put your family through, which you live and die for, you know, you put them through hell and back. Mm -hmm. So I I did. I, I've got to tell you, I struggled with that. It was on my mind. How did that affect you mentally? It's going to affect you, you know, because you're worrying about them. You know, when you're took away from your family and your family's struggling outside and they've got no help, because my family never had any help when I was inside, you know, so you're thinking to yourself, I might not even get to the phone for two or three days. You know, I don't know how they are, what they're doing. So that was a struggle for me. I wasn't really myself. I've never been like a selfish person. Did the jail really bother me? Yeah, I'm bothered. The jail's hell. But no, it never. I'm being honest with you. 
you know, even a solitary confinement, I could sit there, look at the wall, you know, I used to do the training in the cell and stuff. Not trying to act like Rambo, you know, but that's that's just the way, that's just the way as I remember it back then. Your co-accused, did he not get offered a deal and he didn't take it? He got offered a deal, he didn't take it and he got... Uh, did you find out about that beforehand? I told me. Were you, oh, that's good, because I know a lot of people turn Queens because yeah, yeah. of a certain deal with you. Was that ever a concern for you, or did you know he was 100? No, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, no, he never. And he, he 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 got offered to walk out of it, yeah. you know, if he'd have done the damage, you know, but he, he never, and he, you know, the judge for not doing that, give him a 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing at shite, but, but <laughs> oh, yeah. fair fucking play, because he can, no matter what he does in life, he can walk about with his head tail well, high, and he, he, that he money can. can't buy that. No, he can't. And the thing is, as well, for me, it was a good thing because when we was in full Sutton, he came there and, my God, he could do some good stews. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up being the chef yeah. <laughs> for the next two years, whatever it was, you know. So, you know, it was uh, and it was hard times, but that's that's what I really remember about it. See, when, you, when you're getting out, what's the plans then, Peter? Like, was it just straight back into business or just try and keep out of trouble but you know you're still getting surveillance so was it did you ever think you were walking out the gates and you were getting another charge I, I you know it was uh, how can I say one half of me thought you know about my family and I'd think rational and then and then another half of me would be unrational and think you know look at this jail I've done they think they've got the better of me well they haven't so one half was like that and one half was like that so I was a little bit all over the place. Yeah, trying to beat them. But you know yourself, they always win. Always win. They always win. And let me tell you, it's a stupid, stupid attitude. You know, I, the, me the amount of mistakes I've done is like unbelievable. You know, talk about being a, a an idiot, really. You know, so, and I had no need to do anything anyway. I've always been able to get me living. It's just like, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe I got, the worst mental grain in the family or something. I don't know what it is. So you step down that route. You know, you meet people as well. And uh, you just go on from there, don't you? What did you do when you came out? Um, I'd done a little bit when I was on, I think I was on license for uh, 14 months, or whatever it was, on the probation. I had to go to the probation office every week. And then when that happened, um, when I got out, I went abroad. Spain? Yeah, we lived there. How was it there? It was all right. It was, uh, we spent a good few years out there. Happy times, bad times. It was all the same shit, really. <laughs> 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 it's mad bastards everywhere, if not probably That's, more so fucking it is, Spain. Yeah, it fucking is, yeah. I find them, me, I can tell you. Because I watched your interview with the kid. I think he's been a good friend of yours in the boxing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he, he looks a good guy, man, and you seem Chris. to have, yeah. Ah, he's a good pal of mine. Yeah, so, and he's, you were saying that you drove by your friend's house and you walked in, there was fucking guards with guns and he was sitting tied up. Do you know, people, you know, it's hard, it's hard for people to think, you know, has this really happened or is this fella a good storyteller? And I got a text after that interview from a, from one of his good friends, you know, and he's in, he's in Dubai and he said, yeah, and he knew, obviously, People that know me know, you know, mm -hmm. and obviously it happened to the fellow he knows. And he said, listen, he said he, ne he never forgets what you've done for him there. You know, Saved so, his life. 100%. How he was going, it was all, oh, they had all, uh, they had plastic on the floor in the back of this ML Jeep. You know, it was all plasticed out. You know, he was going. <sighs> Even the people upstairs, you know, the two people, you know, those gag bound and gag laid on the bed, stretch it out, you know. I thought, fucking hell, what is this? You know. There was like, <laughs> I don't know what, there was Thai people or whatever. There was definitely Thai. <laughs> but, you know, um, fortunately, it all got diffused. Do you ever think you were going to get one in a nut? I never thought like that, to be honest with you. I'm, that's another thing, really, is uh, I've always been, uh, how can you say, when I was younger, I'd be weary and stuff. Well, when I, when I was faced with a dire straight problem and a, and a life and death problem, I seemed to be able to like deal with it. Do you know what I mean? Like I think I'd be real with it, what can happen, but I, I could deal with it. Do you think that's a higher power, protection, kind of guidance, maybe parents, maybe? I don't know, it could be, I don't know. But um, I certainly wouldn't, I'd never want to be in them positions ever again, you know, so it's not uh, something to be in.
But it's a... Uh, I, I see people, you know, there's a lot of hollow people out there. There's a lot of people that brag and bounce and they can do this and they can do that. But, you know, you don't know what you can do until you until you really test it. You know, and that's the thing. So I, I can see. I, I think prison lands you with a, a lot of stuff for James as well. You know, you see, you know, when I look back, and you are your public enemy number one. And it's uh, you can feel it as well. You know, all around you, you know, that's... You can't really talk to people, you can't trust people because they're all up to no good. You know, the the authorities has got their hands in so many things and so many people as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's not good. So yeah, I've done hard prison. I can't say, I, I never done hard prison. I've never seen a cat D, I've never seen a cat B. I got released on cat A. It was an Alsatian dog up my arse, you know. So I was led out, uh, got led out of Franklin. That's where I finished off. Mm -hmm. So the main jails are done when I was sentenced. I done uh, I done full Sutton, six months on the Cat A wing in uh, Strange Ways, and I finished off in Franklin Prison. What's the worst night you've been in? Uh, on remand, Armley, was in the block. Fucking horrible. Shit hole. Oh, shit hole, yeah. You know, it's an old dungeon, isn't it? And, you know, you'd be in the in the cell, and I never forget it. They had like a like a red bulb. You know, and that red bulb would come on. It was dark, but it was daylight. And in the morning, he used to. He had a little bed with feet on it like that, and you had to put your bed outside. And believe me, it were, when they opened the door and you see in the daylight, it was like a public toilet. You know, there was shit on toilet paper stuck on the wall and all that. You know, it was an absolute dive. And you know, there was. You could just see the the arch because you, the ground level was up. It was like the cells was below. And you'd look and you was at the ground level and all the shite they'd throw out the windows. You know? It was uh yeah. It was that was the worst. I think that's that's gotta be the worst for cleanliness. It was like a proper shithole. And you know, there was all cockroaches in the floor. Every time I woke up in the morning, I'd do that with his shoes, and you'd see a, a spray of black insects all over the floor, you know, because it was like an old dungeon type of place. Mm -hmm. So that's uh that wasn't good there. And you know, and Liverpool. You know, I'd done the block in Liverpool. I spent four months in the block in Liverpool. And I got quite into, uh, yeah, yeah I, got, I got into a few skirmishes there. Although I was 24, bang up. You know, there was, uh, I still got into a few bits of skirmishes. Not many, but some I did, yeah. The Scousers are mad bastards, aren't they? <laughs> they sometimes, mad yeah. Mad bastards, man. I love the Scousers. <laughs> so, there's that... Uh, they're just mad. Every fucking scouser I know, just mad bastards. Like, yeah. So seeing you come out then, Peter, because I know we talk about being guided or some protecting you because you've had a few hits out in your life as well. Where the, is it guns jammed and shit where you could have been fucking off the car straight away? Oh, definitely. You know, one wasn't involved in crime at all. You know, um, when I was only young. Uh, where, you know, where I got went a bit deaf. And, um, and that was just, that was just a, a neighbour you know, that was someone like was mad, you know, so I, I was, that I was lucky there, to be honest with you, because uh, if I hadn't have pushed the gun up, it went up, I knew he was going to do it, but I, I was jammed because my feet was behind the, I was reversing a car out for me old man, actually, and I was, uh, and obviously he's a lot shorter than me, so as I went to put the seat back, I, I seen him coming round, you know, and I just opened the door, and as I got one leg out, he already had the gun there. So as he put the gun there, I just put my head down straight away. Just natural instinct anyway, but it went off. You know, so I was lucky. How do you think you're still here today, Peter? I think uh, maybe... I, I have no idea. I have no idea. But I've been... I was lucky, or maybe the blessed Lord had another plan for me. You know? And I found my faith later on in life as well. Um, we was always brought up with faith anyway, but I d definitely didn't practice it. You know, you couldn't say there was no Christian in me. I wasn't. I wasn't a good person when I was younger. So, seeing you came out then, and it's straight back to business. Then, just you kind of try and provide for the family. That was there more pressure on you over in Spain, or did you find that a little pressure off you with being in a different country? Uh, I felt a little bit more relaxed with it, with it, with with, with the, as far as the police goes. You know. Because uh, that's the reason why I went anyway. Because I was getting, I was getting hassled, you know. 
I was um, I was, dri- I was driving down the road one day, and I think uh, I was in uh, Windermere because that's where I come out to where my missus was because she moved up there. And I remember this police pulling me over in the in the evening, and he says, uh, "You got this wrong with a car. You got that wrong with a car. You know, this and that." And I said, "What's your fucking problem? There's nothing wrong with the car." I said, "It's a new car." And he just typical. Typical local Bobby, really. <laughs> and he said to me, he went, we don't want your type here. He says, not at all. And when I was at the house, they'd be patrolling up and down the house outside. <laughs> I'd look for the window. <laughs> they'd be moving up and down, yeah. And I just said to the missus, look, you know, let's get going. And it didn't help because I was coming back at five o'clock in the morning one day and I must have fell asleep. And the, you know that dual carriageway on the way to Windermere? Mm. It's, a, it's like a dual carriageway, isn't it? There's the grass verge in the middle, yeah? yeah? I went straight over it, yeah? The hub only happens to be in a state Volvo police car on the other side of the road. I woke up and I just about seen him. So the car done a figure eight. It went over his side and I pulled it back over that side. Anyway, the guy, when I went, there was like deb- debris all over the road, road markings, road signs, whatever. All the windows went through in the car or whatever. So I get out the car and I, it's like five in the morning. There's no, there's nobody there. So I'm, I'm kicking all the stuff off the road. Yeah. Anyway, I goes over to this police car and he's literally, he's got his hands on the steering wheel and this guy's crying. He, he's not getting out the car yet. So <laughs> on his window. I said, mate, I said, are you all right? But there's no response out of him. Yeah. He's just like in the car. I don't know if he's going to die or something because cars could hurtling at him at 100 mile an hour. <laughs> anyway, so obviously the car wouldn't move, the car smashed to pieces, so um, more police come. And uh, yeah, so that, you know, that wasn't a, <laughs> that wasn't a good advertisement, so I wasn't uh, too popular with the police there. When did you come back? I uh, came back... Um, The end of uh, 2004, something like that. And you end up in the jail again? Yeah, yeah. Four stretch? Yeah, but I was facing multiple charges. I, I, I had a, I fought a case, uh, f- I fought cases for two years. And um, yeah, and I had a, I come out, listen, forget the two year. The two year was a massive result. Did you not work your own case or something? But did you not I don't know quite a lot, I've done quite a lot of it, yeah, um, but I had help as well. I had a good legal team around me, and they all done bits and pieces. Um, but the main, the main, the main fellow that uh, eventually got me out was um, was a lawyer, and he was like, yeah, he, he was like a fellow from the street. He didn't give a fuck. He had nothing to lose. He was struck off, you know. He had the worst name ever, yeah, <laughs> right. And he he just clicked with me, and it was me and him, you know. And we went at it, you know. But he was a good man, and really. I owe him my life as well to this day. And I'm friends with him to this day. You know, so he was a good man and he helped me. And uh, so that was Nick Green. That's what his name is, Nick Green. He uh, he really helped me. And um, who, who else? Uh, and then I got, uh, and then when I, when I got out of the criminal proceedings, then uh, Middleweek Shahid Chowdhury of Manchester, they really helped me as well. So, um, yeah, and then all people helped me, Fida Hussein, you know, all these type of people helped me, good people, you know, they uh, they all played a part in doing what they could for me, really. But, yeah, we was, uh, I was in there, Cate again, and I was looking uh, multiple charges, you know. If I went, if it would have went wrong, I was, I was getting 30 plus years, so, so that's the way it is. But that's what I mean, you know, uh, uh, and I was told there was nothing that anybody could do. You know, I had the best of London lawyers. I had Orlando Pownall. He done me a, he done me a, a, a dismissal case, and he come downstairs and it's funny this, and he's uh, he's probably one of the high most ranking QCs in the country. You know, well respected, a top fella. He done it. He done a good job for me. It didn't work, but he done a good job for me. And he was uh, anyway. Even the judge was bowing down to this fella. You know, when he went in the dock. You know, this fella was like. Cost a lot of money for two hours, you know, uh, and they, you know the judge was like, you know, honoured to have you in my court and all this, you know, and then, but then the judge said, uh, 
because really, Orlando Pownell was that good. The judge, he made the judge having to comment and the judge said certain things. So I went back down the stairs and I'll never forget it. So I'm in this thing, this little holding thing. He's come down to see me. So he takes his wig off and he puts it on his knee and he went, you know what, he says. He says, they want you, he said, very, very badly. He says, it's on another level. Yeah. And I said, yeah, he said, and he said, listen, I'm being honest with you, Peter. He says, you've got it all to do. He said, these want you, he said, at all cost. He says, he says, I can do what I can, he says, but you've seen there what the situation is. You've seen what he's had to say. I said, yeah, I have. <laughs> he says, uh, anyway, we was having a bit of a, a chat. And I said to him, I said, uh, let me ask you this. I said, you know that judge? I said, I said, obviously, I said, he's giving me a proper addressing down, I said, there, in that, in that dock. He's saying, like, you know, you do realise we haven't got a normal defendant in the dock, you know, spent millions. You know, uh, this is a, you know, this is a, this is a high-ranking uh, criminal, or whatever he's saying, I can't remember exact words, but it was on the basis that they got these posh words, these, these judges, yeah? So I said to him, I said, I said, these judges, I said, they should be impartial, shouldn't they? I said, he's a judge. What does a judge do? I said, he, he sits on the fence, neither one way or the other. Well, I said, how is he impartial? I said, saying to you, the type of man I am in the dock. So what has he read? I said, he knows exactly who I am. And he said to me, oh, Peter, he said, you know, all judges know who you are. He said, you know, you're not a stranger to the circuit. He said, they all know you here. He said, you've only got to pick up the papers. I said, that might be so, I said, but I said, um, he said things in that court, I said, where I was never going to get bail. I said, because he's the one giving me bail. Anyway, he went, do you know what he says? He says, this is what he said to me, this Lando. He says, you are a fucking genius. I said, get up there and tell that motherfucker, I said to recuse himself off this case. I said, that's what you can do. I said, and that's what I'm, he said, are you sure you want to do that? I said, I'm telling you, get up there and get him told. <laughs> he gets up there, yeah. That was it. Took himself off the case. He had to do. He had to do. So then I've got, then, then, then there's, uh, there's no judge. So they're, uh, they're giving me another one. And then they put it back to the recorder of Manchester. The, the head judge in Manchester, who was a recorder of Manchester. And then, you know, I think by then, uh, Nick Green come in. Yes, he did. That's when I got Nick Green. And then the recorder of Manchester looked at it. Because I said, I said, look, I, I, basically, I said, I can't get a fair trial. I said, it's no, it's impossible. I said, all these judges, I said, they just see me as one thing. I said, it's not, this is, I'm being railroaded. So obviously, you know, the recorder of Manchester looked at the papers and just... <laughs> actually flung them in the air I was on video with a link in his trade race prison and he's got the he's got the papers like that and they're reading it and then it's uh, me barrister yeah it was a very good barrister as well but another wild card so I've got a lawyer who's struck off who doesn't give a fuck about anything yeah and then I've got a barrister who's just a complete lunatic but a genius yeah who'd probably go and snort a line in the toilets have all white powder under his nose and be addressed to the judge <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've got defending me <laughs> because listen, I needed these types of people. Mm -hmm. That's not bothered about public school. That ain't bothered about the repercussions. That's not trying to kiss ass and go up the ladder. They could speak your language. Speak my language. I'm going to say as it is. Yeah. These are the type of people I had. So these are the, you know I found this little niche here. You know, and <laughs> spot on. Mm -hmm. You know what are you thinking, Peter? When you're going, you a possibility of getting a fetish shoved up your ass. Like what's going through your mind then? That's everything destroyed, basically could die in prison because a man of your calibre as well, that with a reputation that you had, possibly could you have ever got out if you got a 30? You could have possibly died in there. Like, how, what's going through your mind when there is a possibility of losing your life in prison and leaving everything that you've worked for behind? Well, yeah, I, that's what I mean. I've been there when it's been happening to me. 
And, you know, it's not an exaggeration, you know. Ask every lawyer in Manchester. Ask every lawyer up and down the country. Barristers up and down the country. I've had them all. Yeah. I'll tell you the same thing. You know, I, my life's been on the line quite a few times. And it's... Uh, and I'm not the only one, you know, other people I know has had the same, had the same kind of issues, but, you know, you, you, you do think, you do think, but look, I never thought of the things that you're thinking about. I wasn't bothered about the, what could happen in the prison or whatever. I can handle myself and if anybody had a problem with me, you know, I, I could deal with that. That didn't bother me. The, um, it was just loss of freedom. But you know what I've done in the end, I'll be honest with you, I thought, I found the blessed Lord. I had a fella in there. He used to talk to me about the Bible. He used to talk about the Quran. You know, it was called Baba Hamid. He was being extradited to America. He'd done a good few years in there. You know, and he was uh, he was looked at like the plague. He was looked at. He was charged under terrorism charges and all that. And me and him became good friends in there. And you know, and he and he just said to you know, and this is where you can get good positivity from other people. And this guy wasn't a, he was no criminal or, or anything. You know, he was a, had a good bringing up, he did. And he was saying to me, he said, look, he said, you can fight as much as you want. He said, put your faith in the blessed Lord. He said, and whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. And in the end, that's exactly what I did. So I resigned myself to doing it because all me barristers told me I wasn't going to get off. You know, if you stand trial, you, that's it. You know, so, you know, and uh, thankfully, you know, it worked out and I, um, Eventually, I got out after doing just around two years. What was the plans then when you came out? Because a man who's led the life that you lived, like, been in and out of prison, like, it's, it's no secret, it's out there, but how does a man then have that lifestyle to then be one of the most respected trainers in the world? Like You've trained some of the best fighters in the world, male and female, won world titles. Like, how the fuck does that happen? Like that, that switch of being a criminal to then being training people to be the best fighters on the planet and some would argue some of the greatest ever like like I say for, for Tyson to Savannah like it's unbelievable how the fuck does it you make that transition from the blessed lord <laughs> it ain't me <laughs> you know look I think if you if you if you're good with people you know and you're you're a good hearted person you know that it'll shine through in the end you just gotta search your soul and realise the type of person you are and also you know and stop competitions with, with, with people. Young people always want to be competition with the other one. They want to be the best, you know, but look, you know, we're all people at the end of the day and they should get to know uh, people, but peace and the blessed Lord saved my life, really. And I, you know, and I just pass on to the, uh, to the fighters and I do my best for them because it's about, it's about giving back as well. You know, it's not about being, it's not, it's not about you, it's about doing your best for the fighter. So I, I channel it that way as well. So it does. It has helped in a big way. Because you're out of prison now. You're you're doing great things. That like, was boxing. Obviously, you've got your misses and that. With your your kids. But was boxing the one thing that probably kept you sane and kept you out of trouble? Do you think? Definitely, I think it has because the boxing was full time, and it gave me time as well to step back and have a look at the type of people and uh, and see where it is. And, you know, it made me realise as well that, uh, you know, even when I had money, you know, I didn't enjoy it. What's, what am I doing? And, you know, I looked around and my family and everything and I thought to myself, what's it all about? A lot of stupidness. So that was it. And I'd never look back. And now crime to me, look, if there was a million quid around the corner, I'd, instead of turning left, I'd turn right. I'm not interested in any of it. Mm -hmm. You know, just totally different mindsets altogether. I'm not into crime, period. No crime whatsoever. How do you then become a world-class trainer? Like, what's the steps then to progress to be training world-class fighters? Like, was it always in your blood? You always had that DNA or was it something you've learned with the mistakes that you've made? Might be the mistakes I've made and, uh, you know, and training the fighters and just doing the best and being uh, committed and passionate with it, you know. And I think if, you, if, you, if you're passionate with something, and you really in, you really uh, enjoy what you're doing, then anybody can uh, do anything. So I wouldn't say uh, I don't class myself as uh, being any like special trainer. If you know something, you know something. So it's always been 
boxing to me has always been there. It's always been like second nature. I've grew up in boxing, so it's always been there. I've not, uh, I've not looked at any other body else. I don't look what they do. I've always done my own thing with the fighters. Mm -hmm. Because Tyson's always says he would never be in boxing if it wasn't for you. And then when you took him, is it Germany in Klitschko? And probably one of the biggest nights in British boxing history. Like Klitschko was champion for, what, 10 years undefeated? And he's got the victory. Like what was the plans to go through that and to get that victory, underdog? It was amazing back then, you know. All as I remember, it was a was a lovely young fella, you know. And pff, listen, if it would have meant giving our lives for him to win that fight, we'd have done it, you know. So that's that's my memories of it. All good memories back then. You know? How was that winning a world title and being part of that from the man, the life that you lived to then being clean living and standing on stage with, standing on the ring with world titles and and beating. Possibly some saying that he could never be beaten, especially in his own backyard. You know what? It's funny this, James. Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't look at any of it like that. I got to tell you, I've always been in. When you've been in like circumstances I've been in, and you've seen things what I've seen and stuff like that, you know, it was more or less for him. You know, looking back at it, you know, I was more elated for what he'd done. You know, for by winning them belts and stuff like that. You know, for me. He didn't. He didn't resonate being a uh, winning the belts or whatever. You know that's the way I looked at it. It was all about for him winning the belts. You know that was uh, that was my main that was my main drive. It's like with my own family now. What I'm doing here, you know, and the boxers that I've got. You know, it's all about getting them to where they need to be. So I never really looked at it um, as a massive achievement for myself, really, because uh, it was just m making sure at all costs. That he uh, he got that he got that win. Yeah, it's mad. Like that's such a massive achievement, especially listening to your life and to what you're achieving now and what you're doing with fighters. And the thing about you, Peter, you've not got you're not like every other fucking trainer who's got boxers all around the place. You seem to have a close knit community where you're doing it for the passion and love. You don't need the money. So that's what it shows you that because we know how the fucking corruption that goes in this fucking game, man. It's, it's oh, it corrupt is. to look, the fucking. I look core. at the decisions, and you know they're as bent as fuck. Let's be honest, you know everybody's in everybody's pocket. So, uh, unless you can more or less knock fighters out, sooner or later you're going to come unstuck. How is it having a son that's a boxer and training? Is that difficult? How do you kind of separate from being a father and a trainer? Or is it kind of the same plan every time? I think the difference between being a, 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 like a father and a, and a son, you can, tell, you can tell the son exactly where it's at. But I do that with all the fighters anyway. You know, I tell them where they've gone wrong and what they need to do, and uh, it's up to them to work on it. But ultimately, it's uh, they've got the reins. You can only guide the fighter and tell them where they're going wrong and train them. But they've got to really—you can tell a fighter what to do, but they've got to—they've got to take that knowledge and adapt it for themselves and work it out. You know, you impart advice, but being a trainer is—is uh, is getting them to understand what they're doing. What's the next steps for Huey? He's had a few months off now. Like, what's his plans? Cause he's still young. What is he? What, 29? He's 28. Fucking young. And for how many pro fights has he had? 29. Why so many fights at a young age? You're seeing boxers now in their 30s that have still not had 20 fights. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's had a lot of fights and with his defeats, they're still solid names. Parker, um, who's it? Pol Polovkin? What's his uh, name? Povetkin, Povetkin. Pulev, yeah. Pulev. Like, how is it from a father when if your son loses, how do you then, like we spoke earlier, separate from father and trainer? That is there a, we'll get it next time, or is it straight back to business where you've kind of got to be tough? Not really, you know, it's just a realist thing, you know, these are the mistakes you've made, and this is where we are, you know, but uh, you grow from your mistakes and you learn. And now he's, he is now, he's 28, he's a seasoned professional now, so I'm looking forward to him uh, getting back. And, um, Let's see where he goes. Savannah Marshall, like, love her to bits, such a, a gem, man, kind-hearted person, like, unbelievable what she's achieved, for especially for women's boxing, like the biggest fight in history in women's boxing against Clarissa, who's a, listen, you've got to be honest, is a fucking phenomenal fighter. For me, she was unbelievable on the night, Clarissa. Definitely. I expected Savannah to win, but it's just the way it is. You know yourself, boxing works that way. Like, what made you then take a chance with the female kind of side of boxing? Just by chance. 
I didn't. I didn't have a clue about female boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did not. But, uh, she came in the gym. Lovely young girl, lovely personality. You know, uh, open to learn. Come and asking me different things. Um, and we just got on. We got on. And that's it. Savannah knows there's no agendas with me. You know, what she sees is what she gets. You know, she knows I'm in a corner and she can, uh, ultimately she knows 100% she can trust me with things. And that's the thing. There's no, there's no skullduggery. There's no deals getting done. There's no slyness. You know, she knows uh, 100% that it's, uh, that we're in her interest. How is that to train a female fighter to a male fighter? Is that any difference or is it, or is it different strategies you need? There is a difference, yeah, because, you know, they need... What I will say about female fighters, they need to speak and they need to talk to you, you know. And that's a good thing with Savannah because, you know, she'll pull me to one side and she'll tell me things and she'll speak to me so I can I can work with it. Because you can only read, you can only read a fighter in the gym what's going on because I think boxing is 100% mental. You know, there's a lot of things to uh, to weigh up and adjust as you're going through. What makes a good boxer, Peter? What makes a good boxer a good... I tell you what makes a world-level boxer is that somebody who can adapt to what you're telling them when the, when the shit's at the fan. We can all do good things when uh, you're in control. But what happens when, it, when things get thrown on your toes? The same as in life. What happens when things are going wrong? Can you deal with it? I see people in everyday life and, you know, they talk a good talk on the phone and this and that and the other. I have people say things to me on a telephone that I'd, I'd never dare say because that could be picked up and I could have fucking police at my door. You know, things that I wouldn't dare to say. But they'll say it because they've never got wet, you know. So it's just the same in life in general, you know. But uh, it's the fighter, getting back to the fighter, is how they can deal with pressure. Because you've got to be world level fighters, no matter what pressure comes, is like running water down a stream. It's, it's freely flowing down the stream, there's no breaks. It doesn't speed up, it doesn't do anything. It flows. You've got to flow, no matter what happens. Do you get nervous walking your fighters into the ring? I, don't, I wouldn't say nervous, but at the end of the day, for me, it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's. Uh, an enjoyable experience, you know, because I'm 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 concerned for that fighter. You know, you want them to do well, you know. So, is it enjoyable? Not really. I don't enjoy it because, you know, it's not it's not a business for me. You know, I want that fighter to really do well, yeah, and do the best they can. So obviously, there's pressure there. You know, I can control any kind of pressure. Don't get me wrong. But to say I sit back and enjoy it as a fan. You know, I'm not a fan. I'm involved in it. So I don't actually enjoy it while it's happening. I enjoy it at the end or looking back. Yeah, because Savannah, she says it in an interview, she looks up to you like a father figure. Like, is there a big difference between a male losing and a female losing? Like, has there got to be some sort of different like, nourishment or kind of protection for them after a loss? Or is it just, you just need to fucking go on with it and learn from the mistakes? Yeah, well, I think where the difference between women and men there's a there's a lot more obviously there's more emotions with with women boxers you know but um you know but the strong as well you know they've got that's why we're men and women we're different you know so no they're not the same as men they're different mm -hmm. yeah. because it's a woman isn't it and one's a man so there's different uh, things there's different they've got different attributes there's different everything so there's different mentality how are you feeling with the Clar Clarissa Shields fight? Like, massive fight. Like, everybody was talking about that. Like, because there was back and forth with them for ages. Clarissa's only, she's only been defeated by one person and that was Savannah and the, the amateurs. Like, how was that run up to that fight and going through everything for yourself? Like, mega fight. Like, how was the feeling for you? I've been there before, so it, uh, it's, it's just... Normal? Normal. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, Obviously, I was rooting for Savannah, but Clarissa was fucking outstanding that night as well. Like yeah. two tough bastards, just fucking having a tear up. Like, is there going to be a rematch with that soon? Yeah, I thought it was a tremendous fight, and you're right. You know, Clarissa needs all the credit in the world. You know, for the performance she put on. But yeah, they're going to fight again. Should uh, Savannah be successful in this fight for all the belts, um, July the first, 
she's fighting uh, to unify all the belts. That's super middleweight. Then uh, hopefully following that fight, they can get it on again. Because nobody sees the struggle the female side have to have to go through. Like Savannah's been fighting from fucking, I think it was 12 at such a young age and everything that she's been training for all these fucking years. And hopefully, obviously she's starting to see the good side and hopefully making a bit of money. But is it tough for professionals if they're not at that level to survive? It is. Um, it's hard for fighters now because there's a lot of fighters and not enough platforms to put them on. So it's hard for, uh, unless they're real quality fighters, it's hard for them to get fights. So, you know, that's why a lot of these small hall promoters need maximum credit to keep these fighters busy. How many fighters are you training just now, Peter? I think probably a total of about f five or six, max, and two of them's family. So I think I've got Savannah, April, uh, young heavyweight from uh, North East, I'll say, because I keep getting it wrong. <laughs> From the northeast, Will Howe is called that's three, and um, three, four, five, six. yeah, five, five. I got there's five or six fighters. How does somebody end up in your camp? Is it just by chance, or do you ever look out for a fighter? No, I don't look out for anybody to be honest. And I'm happy if I never had another fighter walk through my door. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's just by chance. You know, if. if the, you know what? Niceness works for me. If they're nice people, you know, then they've got they've got some talent and they want to do something with their life, then that's it. And Will Howe's only come on board because we used him as a sparring partner and he come over and he was a very, very nice young kid. So it's like, you know, yeah, it's, again, you know, all, as I, all as I'm doing there is because I want to just be nice to the fella, help him along, his career, and if I can do that and be an input in his life and get him on the right path, it's a good thing. Have you got your brother's kid as well? I've got my brother's uh, grandson. Yeah, I've got him. So I'm dealing with him at the minute. He's been with me for four years. Um, he, come with me, he was there at 14, and uh, it's coming up four years now. Uh, he's doing well. He won the national championships. So he's, uh, he's coming through. He's 17 now. And uh, yeah, I'll be 18 soon, yeah, so it's coming up four years. And uh, yeah, I've got him. So yeah, he's uh, he's doing he's doing well. So if uh, every, all the corruption and shit in boxing, like, how hard is it for you to try and protect your boxers? I've got a very good fellow in uh, Mick Hennessy. Uh I trust him with the boxers because I know he's a very, very straight man. You know, he's, uh, he's all for the fighters. You know, he's a he's a very humble, you know, simple man. Meaning simple as in fact, uh, you know, he's a family man. You know, he's uh, always, you know, he works from home. He's with his family 24 seven. Um, and he's uh, and he's very, very knowledgeable in boxing as well. So I let him, uh, he deals with all of the, he deals with all the, uh, more or less all the business side. He deals with the match matchmaking of the fighters, getting the fighters on. So he takes a lot of uh, a lot of weight off me. What makes a good man to you, Peter? What makes a good man to me is a man that loves his family. That's very well, what you see is what you get. Down to earth people, and you know, you know, good good people that you could uh, trustable people. That's got got some moral value. How did you make the changes, Peter? Because like, I know a lot of people watch, and I kind of in a rut and. They kind of just don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, look, what, what kind of makes the changes to make you a better man and make you see the world differently? Like, what was your thing to then... I know you talk about Christ, and but you've still got to have some sort of willpower. You've still sort of got to have some sort of fucking grit to, OK, I need to make changes here. Like, what do you think it is? Step away from your circles. Uh, you know, go for long walks by yourself or whatever. Spend time by yourself. Have a look and see where you're going. You know, do you want to chase a line all your life? Or do you want to be something? Because chasing a line all your life, you're never going to be anything. Yeah. You know, and you know, we've all we've all done things in the past. You know, it's not never too late to change. Can somebody who's hell bent on drugs change? Of course they can. If you've got that mental willpower, you can change. Are you stigmatized by it? No. I don't care what people do. Yeah, because people make mistakes and nobody made any more mistakes than I've made. And I've turned my life around. And people can turn theirs around. 
but it's all a waste of time. You know, it be, depends where you come from, like poor areas or whatever. And it's all the people you know, what they're into. You know, you get into it yourself. And, you know, it's all no good. It ends, it, it, it'll end in disaster. You know, everybody's got a chance here. And if they pull themselves out and say, oh, well, you know, you've always got the doubters, haven't you? Well, look, let's just say I don't do this and I stop everything. You know, where am I going? Well, clean yourself up, you know, go back to fucking school or something, learn something, learn a trade. If you can't do anything and you're a thick cunt, learn something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They're available. It's out there. Start wherever you're going to start. There's an opportunity there. You know, pick up the papers, you know, there might be a job vacancy. You know, you might be doing a wheelbarrow, delivering bricks, doing a labouring job. There's always something. But from that labouring job, it put you on the right path, yeah? Being a navvy or whatever you want to be, yeah? And if you, and then have a look, see where that's going to take you from there. Open your eyes, there's opportunities there. It ain't just about being, you know, a tough guy, being a criminal, you know, take drugs, do this, do that, you know, because it's it's all ending nowhere. It's difficult now because a lot of people seem to be more struggling. Like, what do you think of the society we're in now, Peter? Like, how do you see it? I think when I, when, what I see on the social media and what I see, you know, is um, there's like, a lot of people's lost respect with everything. You know, anything goes today. And that's what I see where the problems are. Lack of self-respect. There's a lot of it, yeah. Because me and you are quite outspoken on Twitter. Like, it's not to be controversial, but we've got to, we've got family, we've got kids, and especially, listen, I talk about the transgender thing, and I ain't, I ain't let, I'm going to be clear, I've not got a fucking problem with anybody that wants to be transgender. I've had transgenders on the podcast, we're still friends today, mad as a box of frogs, but they don't phone me up to say, look James, can I read stories to your kids that they're not taking a piss next to my fucking daughter? Like, they're all right people, like, it's not everybody, but when you see people in the fucking mainline, mainstream media and they're putting on dresses and walking in women's changing rooms and walking in women's toilets, reading stories to kids, like, leave the fucking kids alone. Like, there's so much madness that's tr been trying to get normalised now. It fucking pisses me off, man. I think you've hit it on the nail, you know. Do what you want to do in your private life. But, you know, and if you are that way, then you're that way. You know, if, you, if you're mentally tuned that way, then that's, that's what you are. But don't try and ram it down other people's necks. That's not. And expect other people to accept it. Because I don't accept none of that bullshit, I'll tell you now. I don't like it. It's against my beliefs anyway. So none of it's for me. I don't certainly like it. Showing the child that. You know, a man with a fucking big hairy chest talking to a child, half naked, in a fucking bumblebee suit. What is that? It's a freak of nature. Fucking look at that with my child. Yeah. You know, I even send me daughter. I've got my daughter here with the grandkids and stuff. I said, go to that school. I said, tell them straight. I said, and if there's an issue with it, pull them out. I'd rather them pull out and have no education than have that. Because I don't want them growing up like that. Yeah, so it was classed as a mental illness for four or five years ago. I think it is a mental illness. And it's, it's, that's what I say. And if people are feel trapped in another body, listen, it, it possibly could be. But if you're cutting off your dick, cutting off your tits, that's mutilation. For what? But like, there's no... And if it makes you feel better, but the things I'm seeing, the video as I'm seeing... It's just not right. They're trying to normalise bringing the consent of sex down. They're trying to normalise fucking people reading, drag queens reading stories to kids in schools. They're trying to normalise sex education in kids in primary schools. That like it's fucking weird. That like it's weird. The people in higher powers, I don't know if they control the narrative, but it's just not right with me. And I'll continue it. I don't give a fuck if I get cancelled. I don't care if I lose followers or subscribers. I genuinely don't give a fuck. I've got kids. I love my family. I mean, I don't always get it wrong. I've had a fucked up past myself I've been through a lot of pain and misery and I've caused a lot of destruction a lot of destruction destructions happened to my family I'm trying to learn from it but the things I see now I just don't want my kids maybe it's an overprotective father but I would rather be that than try and brainwash my kids into something that just ain't fucking right and no, it ain't right where can you make that right I see a lot of these do-gooders and stuff it ain't right to me and I don't care if I'm ostracised I don't care about anything yeah listen it ain't right it's, a, it's an abomination, that's what I look at. Yeah. What's your daily routine like, Peter? Because obviously the sh shit that you've been through and amazing things that you're doing now, and because you've lost loved ones yourself, you've lost your brother, you've lost your parents, that how do you handle your day? What makes your day go on and how do you push through it? No matter what you do, you know, uh, you push through, we've all got our issues, and you just carry on and uh, you 
you just got to go through life, you know, every day, you know. I look forward to the weekends and having a bit of peace, you know, so uh, that's it for me. But, you know, you work, you push on and uh, try not to think too much and get on with the job. Yeah, that's all you can do, and That's all you can do. Listen, we're all the same. What, what would you do if you'd done nothing? You'd want to look at the wall and get bored of everything. So you just got to carry on. There's mouths to feed, you know, you're responsible to people and you just got to put your best foot forward and do your best. You know, it's not, nobody's Einstein. We all bleed the same, so, and uh, ultimately, we've all got thoughts and uh, you think, you know, what's the point of it all? Did your mum and dad see you when you were doing the training? Did they see you winning world titles? Did they see that side of Peter? Uh, my mo me, me, me mother did, yeah. That's my a mother, beautiful me, thing though, isn't it? Yeah, my mother's only been gone a few years. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I lost my dad, but he's seen me. I just go out to jail and he fucking died. <laughs> he's seen me at my worst, man. He says, look, you need to get your shit together. Yeah. In my mind, I thought, fuck this. Like, I have my old father probably the same, yeah. <laughs> I know, I'd I'm laughing because I know how, same, yeah. how he, he went worrying about his son. That ain't yeah. going to happen with my family. Like I'm doing everything in my power to try and stay on the path. And that, no matter what I do in life, I, I'm no, nowhere near the levels I'm going to get to, but that still plays if I'm happy that plays a part in my mind sometimes I think shit man that like, I must have broke his fucking heart well it does you know you, the stress you can put on other people through your own actions again when you're young you don't realise but it's being selfish you know you know live every day for the people that you care about and you know and do your best for them you know make you know it's nice to be there's nothing more than being nice with people and having good conversations, like like me and you here, mm -hmm. you know, you can have an open conversation because you, you're talking to decent people, you know, and that's the key. What are, what are we by ourselves anyway? You fuck all. Nothing. You're nothing. You know, a lot of people, they put on personas and, you know, there's no need for it because sensible people can see through all that bullshit anyway, you know. And, you know, you've got some people who are genuinely just clowns, you know. Just, that's their makeup. So you just pack them up, don't you? You give bad energy, so you just leave them alone. You know, the world's not perfect. But, you know, you can find good people. It's rare. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned, Peter, through your, your years of experience? <sighs> so many. So many, James. Uh, you know, good people. If you can find good people, uh, you know, stick with them. Because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there. I know we've touched on it before, but how important is it to have a, a, a strong woman by your side who's never left you? You could have been in the jail and they've disappeared and it's understandable that they've got every reason to leave. But how important is it to have a strong woman by your side who's willing to fight your corner, who's willing to put up with the pain and never crumble, never break? Like, well, you, you know, listen, they're blessed, aren't they? You know, they're gifted with something. And you might have something yourself because, you know, to stand with you like that, who does that? I've never had anybody do that in my life. You know, you know, talk about, you know, the loyalty, and this is where it comes down to that, that love in the heart for you. You know, you you can't buy that. That's priceless. That's the most valuable thing human nature can possibly have, and that comes for me. That comes. It's, it's a divine. It's a divine power. And that's what we've got, ultimately. When you peel it all away, we've only got the love for each other, that's it. And when you've got that, and somebody will walk through walls and die for you, and, you know, and live every day of the sentence with you, that's a special person. And they they deserve your life for them. Who's the greatest fighter you've ever seen, Peter? You know, I love Muhammad Ali when I was a young fellow growing up. Uh, there's loads of, loads of good fighters. You know, uh, Larry Holmes, uh, Lennox Lewis, even recent... Uh, Holyfield, Mike Tyson, all tremendous fighters. You know, uh, Riddick Bowe, top fighter. You know, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, right back to Ezard Charles, you know, Rocky Marciano, you know, Jack Johnson goes right back. What do you think of the boxers? Jack Dempsey as well, all good fighters. What do you think of boxers now? Do you think it's more showmanship? It's more, they became fucking more influencers than anything. Like, I see some boxers now and I think, Kind of boxing's getting took away from people just having a tear up. The best fighting the best. That like, it has changed completely. Like, I'm not in it as much to understand the ins and outs of it, but 
I'd like to think I'm clued up on the way I see things and the way I see things well, online. It's what you get now. It's a lot. You know, a lot of fighters now they talk a lot of cringe shit because we're in a cringe society. You know, you look on that social media. It's all cringe crap, isn't it? So it's going to work. You know, talk smack, and the public love it. It's like all this white collar shite. <laughs> you know, well, I'm looking at that. These can't throw. They, they ain't got a fucking clue. Mm -hmm. You know, but they're super famous because they're dealing with people like themselves. This is a society we're in. We're in. So, do I favour it? No, I think it's a lot of bollocks. How is that from somebody who's in boxing, who's worked for world class fighters, to seeing somebody who's got a big social media following making more money than world champion fighters? Anyway, it's good for them. You know, whatever they're going to do, it's good for them. They're off the street. They're not up to no good. Having a respect of a world level fighter? No. You're just a white collar fighter, just a celebrity boxer. You know, that's all it is. You know, like you said, they can have massive followings. Because I said, look, you talk a lot of shit, and shit attracts shit. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it is, it's fucking mad. But the world we're living in. What do you want me to say about it? You know, yeah. world level fighters yeah, are in the gym. Yeah. It's a different ball game, there's a different quality between a world level fighter. And a joker, isn't he? What do you think the state of British boxing is just now? I think British boxing is uh, it, it, it's, it's doing well. And um, there's a lot of good fighters out there. Um, yeah. But I, I do... Uh, listen, I don't look at... Uh, I don't go down social medias. I, listen, there's some good comments. You'll see what people's got to say. Some, there's some good people out there. You know, but there's, there's a lot of shite as well. Do you see a positive future for boxing going forward? I do, yeah. I think uh, I think there's too many politics now. There is a lot of politics, and I think it needs to get back. Will it get back? Hopefully, it will do. Yeah, the boxing. Like I remember the days of like my, uh, Princeton Zeman, Steve Collins, Eubank, Ben. And I used to remember I was sitting watching them with my dad, and it was just fucking ruthless, just ruthless fighting, just. I always remember the the the, the one you were involved in with Fury, Tyson, Germany. I always remember Kessler, Kozagi, Josh Taylor as well. That undisputed the boy man, like fucking unbelievable and un, and so many fights. But I think a lot of fighters don't get the recognition they deserve as well. Yeah, I think they do because uh, fighters that think don't want to sell their ass in public seem to like you know don't get don't get that much attention. Like I said. It's it's a cringe society, isn't it? Like all this, everything goes. You know, you want to shag a man tomorrow, shag mm -hmm. a with bed the next day. It's fine, you know. Don't worry about it. Yeah. But you know, it's all this. You know, anything goes, shit, isn't it? So if you want to be a clown, you'll get you'll get plenty of clowns supporting you, won't you? Yeah. But if you want to be somebody proper who wants to say, right, I'm having a fight, I'm going to best out there, let's get it on. You won't get that much recognition mm -hmm. because that's what it is. But real recognize is real. And hopefully real comes through. That's what we can only hope for in boxing. We want to see real fights, real people, not all this poncy fucking carry-on. Who do you think is the best pound-for-pound pound boxer ever, of all time? God, there's so many, uh, James, yeah. there's so many. It's a difficult one. To say who's the best of all time, I would say Sugar Ray Leonard in the later eras has got to be right up there. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was uh, something... He was like super special, that guy. You know, what a fighter he was. All of the, there's been so many greats, hasn't there? You know, you know Marvin Agler, you know, all of these uh, type of fighters. You know, I've, I just can't think of fun, but there's, there's so many. You can't, you can't just single one fighter out. Yeah. You know, it's impossible. Who do you think of Floyd Mayweather's career? He's a gifted fighter. You know, who could say anything different? He's a... Uh, He's been lucky on a few, one or two of his Sorry, fights. I'm still not sure. He's been lucky in one or two of his fights, but listen, who can argue what the man's done? You know, it's a very special, you know, special individual. You know, look what he done when he fought Canelo. And schooled look, him. He, he schooled Canelo, and look at what Canelo's done. So how could you say Mayweather needs needs the credibility he's got because serious fella can do it inside, back up exactly what he's saying. Do you think that's because he's flamboyant nature he doesn't get the credit because people genuinely fucking hate him? Because he's a show-offs kind of mentality? 
yeah, there is there, there, there will be some of that, but you know, you got to take your hat off to the fella because serious, serious fighter. Going forward for the future, Peter, what's your plans? My plan is is to find peace of mind, um, crack on with the fighters. Hopefully they'll do well and uh, work hard, head down on a mission. Yeah, good stuff. For anybody that's watching, Peter, that's maybe stuck in a life of struggle or maybe don't think they can see any light, like, what advice would you have for them? You don't know what tomorrow brings and nobody does. And if you can't see a way out, just stop what you're doing. Have a look because what you're doing isn't working. And there is always a way out. Speak to people. You know, find people you can speak to. There's good people out there. You know, if a tramp knocked on my door, you know, and he couldn't get food and he never had no money and the world was shut, if he knocked on my door and opened it, I'd feed him, that's it. Give him a few quid. There's people out there. It's not just me. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of good people that are out there today. But, you know, there's, uh, so that's what I would say. Don't watch too much television. You know, just get your life. Look, clean living is the key. Clean living. If you can start with clean living and tidy your act up, you know, seek help. There is help out there somewhere. Just sat there doing the same shit every day. You, your life's running away and you'll go further, further into a deeper depressive mode. And it's very easy to fall in the wrong circles. Finish up on a positive, Peter. What's the one of the happiest moments of your life? Um, what in boxing or outside of anything. it? Anything. Anything. When you look back and you go, "I was fucking happy then." Uh, my family. I'm a family man, so my wife, my children, uh, my mother and father. You know, when I, when there was all everybody was everybody was around. You know, Brussels was alive. They're the happiest times. They'll, I'll never get them times back. Do you think we can not appreciate those times? That's what I'm saying. We, you, you know, I'm down here with the family and that, and let's just try to live in that moment and enjoy that moment because I've been watching videos and people showing old videos of their, their family and their, their mum and dad and kids when they're, and then they grow up to be 13, 14, in their 20s, and it just goes in a heartbeat. Do you think that's what it's about, is enjoying those moments because you never get them back? Definitely, you need to enjoy your family boy, because they're not always going to be there. Yeah, Peter, listen, love listen, you, big James, man. Absolutely um, respect. Lots of respect for you and, as well. um, Thanks for bringing me into your home, giving me your interview, and I look forward to seeing what you do no in the problem. future. I love all your interviews. Yeah, Keep up you. the good work, James. God bless God you. Bless Peter. you.